Disc 2. Chapter 2. That's Hercule Poirot, the detective, said Mrs. Allerton. She and her son were sitting in brightly painted scarlet basket chairs outside the Cataract Hotel at Aswan. They were watching the retreating figures of two people, a short man dressed in a white silk suit and a tall, slim girl. Tim Allerton sat up in an unusually alert fashion. What's that funny little man? he asked incredulously. Hmm, that funny little man. Tim said, What on earth's he doing out here? His mother laughed. Oh, darling, you sound quite excited. Why do men enjoy crime so much? I hate detective stories and never read them, but I don't think Monsieur Poirot is here with any ulterior motive. He's made a good deal of money, and he's seeing life, I fancy. Hmm, seems to have an eye for the best-looking girl in the place. Mrs. Allerton tilted her head a little on one side as she considered the retreating backs of Monsieur Poirot and his companion. The girl by his side overtopped him by some three inches. She walked well, neither stiffly nor slouchingly. Mm, I suppose she is quite good-looking, said Mrs. Allerton. She shot a little glance sideways at Tim. Somewhat to her amusement, the fish rose at once. Mm, she's more than quiet. Pity she looks so bad-tempered and sulky. Perhaps that's just expression, dear. Mm, unpleasant young devil, I think. But she's pretty enough. The subject of these remarks was walking slowly by Poirot's side. Rosalie Otterborn was twirling an unopened parasol, and her expression certainly bore out what Tim had just said. She looked both sulky and bad-tempered. Her eyebrows were drawn together in a frown, and the scarlet line of her mouth was drawn downwards. They turned to the left outside of the hotel gate and entered the cool shade of the public gardens. Hercule Poirot was prattling gently, his expression that of beatific good humour. He wore a white silk suit, carefully pressed, a Panama hat, and carried a highly ornamental fly-whisk with a sham amber handle. It enchants me, he was saying. The black rocks of Elephantine, and the sun, the little boats on the river. Yes, it is good to be alive. He paused and then added, You do not find it so, mademoiselle? Rosalie Otterborn said shortly, well, I th It's all right, I suppose. I think Aswan's a gloomy sort of place. The hotel's half empty and everyone's about a hundred. She stopped, biting her lip. Hercule Poirot's eyes twinkled. It is true, yes. I have one leg in the grave. Oh, I, I wasn't thinking of you, said the girl. I'm sorry. That sounded rude. Not at all. It is natural you should wish for companions of your own age. Ah, well, there is one young man at least. Well, the one who sits with his mother all the time. I like her, but I think he looks dreadful. So conceited. Poirot smiled. And I? Am I conceited? Oh, I don't think so. She was obviously uninterested, but the fact did not seem to annoy Poirot. He merely remarked with placid satisfaction, My best friend says that I am very conceited. Oh, well, said Rosalie vaguely, I suppose you have something to be conceited about. Unfortunately, crime doesn't interest me in the least. Poirot said solemnly, I am delighted to learn that you have no guilty secret to hide. Just for a moment, the sulky mask of her face was transformed as she shot him a swift questioning glance. Poirot did not seem to notice it as he went on. Madame, your mother was not at lunch today. She is not indisposed, I trust. Oh, no, this place doesn't suit her, said Rosalie briefly. I shall be glad when we leave. We are fellow passengers, are we not? We both make the excursion up the Wadi Halfa and the second cataract? Yes. They came out from the shade of the garden onto a dusty stretch of road bordered by the river. Five watchful bead sellers, two vendors of postcards, three sellers of plaster scarabs, a couple of donkey boys and some detached but hopeful infantile riffraff closed in upon them. You want pizza? Very good, very cheap. Lady, you want scarab? Look, great queen, very lucky. You look, sir, real lapis. Very good, very cheap. You want a ride, donkey, sir? 
It's very good donkey. This donkey whiskey and soda, sir. You want to go to granite quarry, sir? This very good donkey. Other donkey very bad, sir. This donkey fall down. You want postcard very cheap, very nice. Look, lady, only ten piastres. Very cheap. Lapis, this ivory. This very good fly whisk. All this your lamp. You go out in boat, sir. I got very good boat, sir. You ride back to hotel, lady. This first class donkey. Hercule Poirot made vague gestures to rid himself of this human cluster of flies. Rosalie stalked through them like a sleepwalker. It's best to pretend to be deaf and blind, she remarked. The infantile riffraff ran alongside, murmuring plaintively, Bakshish, bakshish, hippipora, very good, very light. Their gaily coloured rags trailed picturesquely, and the flies lay in clusters on their eyelids. They were most persistent. The others fell back and launched a fresh attack on the next comer. Now Poirot and Rosalie only ran the gauntlet of the shops. Suave, persuasive accents here. You visit my shop today, sir? You want an ivory crocodile, sir? You've not been in my shop yet, sir. I show you very beautiful things. They turned into the fifth shop, and Rosalie handed over several rolls of films, the object of the walk. Then they came out again and walked towards the river's edge. One of the Nile steamers was just mooring. Poirot and Rosalie looked interestedly at the passengers. Quite a lot, aren't there? commented Rosalie. She turned her head as Tim Allerton came up and joined them. He was a little out of breath, as though he had been walking fast. They stood there for a moment or two, and then Tim spoke. Hmm, an awful crowd as usual, I suppose," he remarked disparagingly, indicating the disembarking passengers. "They're usually quite terrible," agreed Rosalie. All three wore the air of superiority assumed by people who are already in a place when studying new arrivals. "Hello," said Tim, his voice suddenly excited. "I'm damned if that isn't Lynette Bridgeway." If the information left Poirot unmoved, it stirred Rosalie's interest. She leaned forward, and her sulkiness quite dropped from her as she asked, "Where, that one in white?" "Yes, there with the tall man. They're coming ashore now. He's the new husband, I suppose. Can't remember his name now." "Doyle," said Rosalie. "Simon Doyle. It was in all the newspapers. She's simply rolling, isn't she?" <laughs> "Only about the richest girl in England," said Tim cheerfully. The three lookers-on were silent, watching the passengers come ashore. Poirot gazed with interest at the subject of the remarks of his companions. He murmured, "She is beautiful." Ah,、oh, some people have got everything," said Rosalie bitterly. There was a queer, grudging expression on her face as she watched the other girl coming up the gangplank. Lynette Doyle was looking as perfectly turned out as if she was stepping onto the centre of the stage in a revue. She had something too of the assurance of a famous actress. She was used to being looked at, to being admired, to being the centre of the stage wherever she went. She was aware of the keen glances bent upon her, and at the same time almost unaware of them. Such tributes were part of her life. She came ashore playing a role, even though she played it unconsciously. The rich, beautiful society bride on her honeymoon. She turned with a little smile and a light remark to the tall man by her side. He answered, and the sound of his voice seemed to interest Hercule Poirot. His eyes lit up, and he drew his brows together. The couple passed close to him. He heard Simon Doyle say, "We'll try and make time for it, darling. We can easily stay a week or two if you like it here." His face was turned towards her, eager, adoring, a little humble. Poirot's eyes ran over him thoughtfully. The square shoulders, the bronzed face, the dark blue eyes, the rather childlike simplicity of the smile. <laughs> Lucky devil," said Tim after they passed. "Fancy finding an heiress who hasn't got adenoids and flat feet." They look frightfully happy," said Rosalie with a note of envy in her voice. She said suddenly, but so low that Tim did not catch the words. "It isn't fair." Poirot heard. However, he had been frowning somewhat perplexedly, but now he flashed a quick glance towards her. Tim said, "I must collect some stuff for my mother now." He raised his hat and moved off. Poirot and Rosalie retraced their steps slowly in the direction of the hotel, waving aside fresh proffers of donkeys. So, 
It is not fair, mademoiselle, said Poirot gently. The girl flushed angrily. I don't know what you mean. Oh, I am repeating what you said just now under your breath. Oh, yes, you did. Rosalie Otterborn shrugged her shoulders. Well, it really seems a little too much for one person. Money, good looks, marvellous figure, and... She paused, and Poirot said, And love? Eh? And love? But you do not know. She may have been married for her money. <laughs> Didn't you see the way he looked at her? Oh, yes, mademoiselle. I saw all there was to see. Indeed, I saw something that you did not. What was that? Poirot said slowly, I saw, mademoiselle, dark lines below a woman's eyes. I saw a hand that clutched a sunshade so tight that the knuckles were white. Rosalie was staring at him. What do you mean? I mean that all is not the gold that glitters. I mean that all this lady is rich and beautiful and beloved. There is all the same, something that is not right. And I know something else. Yes? I know, said Poirot, frowning, that somewhere at some time I have heard that voice before, the voice of Monsieur Doyle, and I wish I could remember where. But Rosalie was not listening. She had stopped dead. With the point of her sunshade she was tracing patterns in the loose sand. Suddenly she broke out fiercely. I'm odious. I'm quite odious. I'm just a beast through and through. I'd like to tear the clothes off her back and stamp on her lovely, arrogant, self-confident face. I'm just a jealous cat. But that's what I feel like. She's so horribly successful and poised and assured. Hercule Poirot looked a little astonished by the outburst. He took her by the arm and gave her a friendly little shake. Tenez, you will feel better for having said that. I just hate her. I've never hated anyone so much at first sight. Magnificent. Rosalie looked at him doubtfully. Then her mouth twitched, and she laughed. Bien, said Poirot, and laughed too. They proceeded amicably back to the hotel. I must find Mother, said Rosalie, as they came into the cool, dim hall. Poirot passed out on the other side onto the terrace overlooking the Nile. Here were little tables set for tea, but it was early still. He stood for a few moments looking down onto the river, then strolled down through the gardens. Some people were playing tennis in the hot sun. He paused to watch them for a while, then went on down the steep path. It was there, sitting on a bench overlooking the Nile, that he came across the girl of Chez Ma Tante. He recognized her at once. Her face as he had seen it that night, was securely etched upon his memory. The expression on it was now very different. She was paler, thinner, and there were lines that told of a great weariness and misery of spirit. He drew back a little. She had not seen him, and he watched her for a while without her suspecting his presence. Her small foot tapped impatiently on the ground. Her eyes, dark with a kind of smouldering fire, had a queer kind of suffering, dark triumph in them. She was looking out across the Nile, where the white-sailed boats glided up and down the river. A face and a voice. He remembered them both. This girl's face and the voice he had heard just now, the voice of a newly made bridegroom. And even as he stood there considering the unconscious girl, the next scene in the drama was played. Voices sounded above. The girl on the seat started to her feet. Lynette Doyle and her husband came down the path. Lynette's voice was happy and confident. The look of strain and tenseness of muscle had quite disappeared. Lynette was happy. The girl who was standing there took a step or two forward. The other two stopped dead. Hello, Lynette, said Jacqueline de Belfort. So here you are. We never seem to stop running into each other. Hello, Simon. How are you? Lynette Doyle had shrunk back against the rock with a little cry. Simon Doyle's good-looking face was suddenly convulsed with rage. He moved forward as though he would have liked to strike the slim, girlish figure. With a quick, bird-like turn of her head, she signalled her realisation of a stranger's presence. Simon turned his head and noticed Poirot. 
he said awkwardly. Ah, uh, hello, Jacqueline. We didn't expect to see you here. The words were unconvincing in the extreme. The girl flashed white teeth at them. Quite a surprise, she asked. Then, with a little nod, she walked up the path. Poirot moved delicately in the opposite direction. As he went, he heard Lynette Doyle say, Simon, for God's sake, Simon, what can we do? Chapter 3 Dinner was over. The terrace outside the Cataract Hotel was softly lit. Most of the guests staying at the hotel were there sitting at little tables. Simon and Lynette Doyle came out, a tall, distinguished-looking grey-haired man with a keen, clean-shaven American face beside them. As the little group hesitated for a moment in the doorway, Tim Allerton rose from his chair nearby and came forward. "'You don't remember me, I'm sure,' he said pleasantly to Lynette, "'but I'm Joanna Southwood's cousin.' "'Oh, of course. How stupid of me. You're Tim Allerton. "'This is my husband.' "'A faint tremor in the voice. Pride. Shyness. "'And this is my American trustee, Mr. Pennington.' Tim said, "'You must meet my mother.' "'A few minutes later they were sitting together in a party. "'Lynette in the corner, Tim and Pennington each side of her, "'both talking to her, vying for her attention. "'Mrs. Allerton talked to Simon Doyle. "'The swing doors revolved. "'A sudden tension came into the beautiful upright figure "'sitting in the corner between the two men. "'Then it relaxed as a small man came out and walked across the terrace. "'Mrs. Allerton said,' "'You're not the only celebrity here, my dear. "'That funny little man is Hercule Poirot.' "'She had spoken lightly, "'just out of instinctive social tact to bridge an awkward pause, "'but Lynette seemed struck by the information. "'Hercule Poirot? "'Oh, of course, I've heard of him.' "'She seemed to sink into a fit of abstraction. "'The two men on either side of her were momentarily at a loss.' Poirot had strolled across to the edge of the terrace, but his attention was immediately solicited. "'Sit down, Monsieur Poirot. What a lovely night!' He obeyed. "'Mais oui, madame, it is indeed beautiful.' He smiled politely at Mrs. Otterborn. What draperies of black Ninon, and that ridiculous turban effect! Mrs. Otterborn went on in her high, complaining voice. Quite a lot of notabilities here now, aren't there? I expect we shall see a paragraph about it in the papers soon. Society beauties, famous novelists. She paused with a slight mock, modest laugh. Poirot felt, rather than saw, the sulky, frowning girl opposite him flinch and set her mouth in a sulkier line than before. You have a novel on the way at present, madame? he inquired. Mrs. Otterborn gave her little self-conscious laugh again. <laughs> I'm being dreadfully lazy. I really must set to. My public is getting terribly impatient, and my publisher, poor man, appeals by every post, even cables. Again he felt the girl shift in the darkness. I don't mind telling you, Monsieur Poirot, I'm partly here for local colour. Snow on the Desert's Face. Mm, that's the title of my new book. Powerful. Suggestive. Snow on the Desert. "'melted in the first flaming breath of passion.' "'Rosalie got up, muttering something, "'and moved away down into the dark garden. "'One must be strong,' went on Mrs. Otterborn, "'wagging the turban emphatically. "'Strong meat! That is what my books are. "'Libraries may ban them, no matter. "'I speak the truth. "'Sex! Ah, Monsieur Poirot, "'why is everyone so afraid of sex? "'The pivot of the universe!' You have read my books? Uh, alas, madame, you comprehend I do not read many novels. My work, Mrs. Otterborn said firmly. I must give you a copy of Under the Fig Tree. I think you will find it significant. It is outspoken, but it is real. Uh, that is most kind of you, madame. I will read it with pleasure. Mrs. Otterborn was silent a minute or two. She fidgeted with a long chain of beads that was wound twice round her neck. She looked swiftly from side to side. Perhaps 
I'll just slip up and get it for you now. Oh, Madame Pre, do not trouble yourself. Later. No, no, it's no trouble. She rose. I'd like to show you. What is it, Mother? Rosalie was suddenly at her side. Nothing, dear. I was just going up to get a book for Monsieur Poirot. Oh, the fig tree. I'll get it. But you don't know where it is, dear. I'll go. Yes, I do. The girl went swiftly across the terrace and into the hotel. Let me congratulate you, Madame, on a very lovely daughter," said Poirot with a bow. Rosalie, yes, yes, she is good-looking, but she's very hard, Monsieur Poirot, and no sympathy with illness. She always thinks she knows best. She imagines she knows more about my health than I do myself. Poirot signalled to a passing waiter. A liqueur, Madame, a chartreuse, a, a crème de menthe. Mrs. Otterbourne shook her head vigorously. Uh, no, no, uh, no! I'm practically a teetotaler. You may have noticed I never drink anything but water, or perhaps lemonade. I cannot bear the taste of spirits.、Mm, then may I order you a lemon squash, Madame? He gave the order: one lemon squash and one Benedictine. The swing door revolved. Rosalie passed through and came towards them, a book in her hand. Here you are, she said. Her voice was quite expressionless, almost remarkably so. Monsieur Poirot has just ordered me a lemon squash," said her mother. "And you, Mademoiselle, what will you take?" "Nothing," she added, suddenly conscious of the curtness. "Nothing, thank you." Poirot took the volume which Mrs. Otterbourn held out to him. It still bore its original jacket, a gaily coloured affair representing a lady with smartly shingled hair and scarlet fingernails sitting on a tiger skin in the traditional costume of Eve. Above her was a tree with the leaves of an oak, bearing large and improbably coloured apples. It was entitled "Under the Fig Tree" by Salome Otterbourne. On the inside was a publisher's blurb. It spoke enthusiastically of the superb courage and realism of the study of a modern woman's love life. Fearless, unconventional, realistic were the adjectives used. Poirot bowed and murmured, "I am honoured, Madame." As he raised his head, his eyes met those of the authoress's daughter. Almost involuntarily, he made a little movement. He was astonished and grieved at the eloquent pain they revealed. It was at that moment that the drinks arrived and created a welcome diversion. Poirot lifted his glass gallantly. À votre santé, Madame, Mademoiselle. Mrs. Otterbourne, sipping her lemonade, murmured, "Oh, so refreshing." <laughs> Delicious. Silence fell on the three of them. They looked down to the shining black rocks on the Nile. There was something fantastic about them in the moonlight. They were like vast prehistoric monsters lying half out of the water. A little breeze came up suddenly, and as suddenly died away. There was a feeling in the air of hush, of expectancy. Hercule Poirot brought his gaze to the terrace and its occupants. Was he wrong, or was there the same hush of expectancy there? It was like a moment on the stage when one is waiting for the entrance of the leading lady, and just at that moment, the swing doors began to revolve once more. This time, it seemed as though they did so with a special air of importance. Everyone had stopped talking and was looking towards them. A dark, slender girl in a wine-coloured evening frock came through. She paused for a minute, then walked deliberately across the terrace and sat down at an empty table. There was nothing flaunting, nothing out of the way about her demeanour, and yet it had somehow the studied effect of a stage entrance. Well," said Mrs. Otterbourn. She tossed her turbaned head. She seems to think she's somebody. That girl. Poirot didn't answer. He was watching. The girl had sat down in a place where she could look deliberately across at Lynette Doyle. Presently, Poirot noticed Lynette Doyle leant forward, and said something, and a moment later got up and changed her seat. She was now sitting facing in the opposite direction. Poirot nodded thoughtfully to himself. It was about five minutes later that the other girl changed her seat to the opposite side of the terrace. She sat smoking and smiling quietly, the picture of contented ease. 
but always, as though unconsciously, her meditative gaze was on Simon Doyle's wife. After a quarter of an hour, Lynette Doyle got up abruptly and went into the hotel. Her husband followed her almost immediately. Jacqueline de Belfort smiled and twisted her chair round. She lit a cigarette and stared out over the Nile. She went on smiling to herself. Chapter 4 Monsieur Poirot? Poirot got hastily to his feet. He had remained sitting out on the terrace alone after everyone else had left. Lost in meditation, he had been staring at the smooth, shiny black rocks when the sound of his name recalled him to himself. It was a well-bred, assured voice, a charming voice, although perhaps a trifle arrogant. Hercule Poirot, rising quickly, looked into the commanding eyes of Lynette Doyle. She wore a wrap of rich purple velvet over her white satin gown, and she looked more lovely and more regal than Poirot had imagined possible. "'You are Monsieur Hercule Poirot?' said Lynette. It was hardly a question. "'At your service, madame.' "'You know who I am, perhaps?' "'Yes, madame. I have heard your name. I know exactly who you are.' Lynette nodded. That was only what she had expected— she went on in her charming, autocratic manner. "'Will you come with me into the card-room, Monsieur Poirot? I'm very anxious to speak to you.' "'Certainly, madame.' She led the way into the hotel. He followed. She led him into the deserted card-room and motioned him to close the door. Then she sank down on a chair at one of the tables, and he sat down opposite her. She plunged straight away into what she wanted to say. There were no hesitations. Her speech came flowingly. I've heard a great deal about you, Monsieur Poirot, and I know that you are a very clever man. It happens that I am urgently in need of someone to help me, and I think very possibly that you are the man who could do it. Poirot inclined his head. You are very amiable, madame, but you see I am on holiday, and when I am on holiday I do not take cases. That could be arranged. It was not offensively said only with the quiet confidence of a young woman who had always been able to arrange matters to her satisfaction. Lynette Doyle went on. I am the subject, Monsieur Poirot, of an intolerable persecution. That persecution has got to stop. My own idea was to go to the police about it, but my, my husband seems to think that the police would be powerless to do anything. Perhaps if you would explain a little further, murmured Poirot politely, Oh, yes, sir, I will do so. The matter is perfectly simple. There was still no hesitation, no faltering. Lynette Doyle had a clear-cut, business-like mind. She only paused a minute so as to present the facts as concisely as possible. Before I met my husband, he was engaged to a Miss de Belfort. She was also a friend of mine. My husband broke off his engagement to her. They were not suited in any way. She, I am sorry to say, took it rather hard. I am very sorry about that, but these things cannot be helped. She made certain, well, threats, to which I paid very little attention, and which I must say she has not attempted to carry out. But instead, she has adopted the extraordinary course of following us about wherever we go. Poirot raised his eyebrows. Oh, uh, rather an unusual uh, revenge? Very unusual and very ridiculous, but also annoying. She bit her lip. Poirot nodded. Oh, yes, I can imagine that. You are, I understand, on your honeymoon? Yes. It happened, the first time, at Venice. She was there, at Daniele's. I thought it was just coincidence, rather embarrassing, but that was all. Then we found her on board the boat at Brindisi. We, we understood that she was going on to Palestine. We left her, as we thought, on the boat. But, but when we got to Mina House, she was there, waiting for us. Poirot nodded. And now? We came up the Nile by boat. I, I was half expecting to find her on board. And when she wasn't there, I thought she had stopped being so, so childish. But when we got here, she, she was here. Waiting. Poirot eyed her keenly for a moment. 
She was still perfectly composed, but the knuckles of the hand that was gripping the table were white with the force of her grip. He said, And you are afraid this state of things may continue? Yes. She paused. Of course, the whole thing is idiotic. Jacqueline is making herself utterly ridiculous. I'm surprised she hasn't got more pride, more dignity. Poirot made a slight gesture. There are times, madame, when pride and dignity, they go by the board. There are other, stronger emotions. Oh, yes, possibly, Lynette spoke impatiently. But what on earth can she hope to gain by all this? It is not always a question of gain, madame. Something in his tone struck Lynette disagreeably. She flushed, and she said quickly, No, you're right. A discussion of motives is beside the point. The crux of the matter is that this has got to be stopped. And how do you propose that that should be accomplished, madame? Poirot asked. Well, naturally, my husband and I cannot continue being subjected to this annoyance. There must be some kind of legal redress against such a thing. She spoke impatiently. Poirot looked at her thoughtfully as he asked, has she threatened you in actual words in public, used insulting language, attempted any bodily harm? No. Then, frankly, madame, I do not see what you can do. If it is a young lady's pleasure to travel in certain places, and those places are the same, where you and your husband find yourself, eh bien, what of it? The air is free to all. There is no question of her forcing herself upon your privacy. It is always in public that these encounters take place. You mean there is nothing that I can do about it? Lynette sounded incredulous. Poirot said placidly, Nothing at all as far as I can see. Mademoiselle de Belfort is within her rights. But, but it's maddening. It is intolerable that I should have to put up with this. Poirot said dryly, I sympathize with you, madame, especially as I imagine that you have not often had to put up with things. Lynette was frowning. There must be some way of stopping it, she murmured. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. You can always leave. Move on somewhere else, he suggested. But then she will follow. Very possibly, yes. It's absurd. Precisely. Anyway, why should I, we, run away? As though, as though... She stopped. Exactly, madame. As though... It is all there, is it not? Lynette lifted her head and stared at him. What do you mean? Poirot altered his tone. He leant forward. His voice was confidential, appealing. He said very gently, Why do you mind so much, madame? Why? But it's maddening, irritating to the last degree. I've told you why. Poirot shook his head. Not altogether. Lynette said again, What do you mean? Poirot leant back, folded his arms, and spoke in a detached, impersonal manner. Écoutez, madame, I will recount to you a little history. It is that one day, a month or two ago, I am dining in a restaurant in London. At the table next to me are two people, a man and a girl. They are very happy, so it seems very much in love. They talk with confidence of the future. It is not that I listen to what is not meant for me, they are quite oblivious of who hears them and who does not. The man's back is to me, but I can watch the girl's face. It is very intense. She is in love, heart, soul, and body, and she is not of those who love lightly and often. With her it is clearly the life and the death. They are engaged to be married, these two, that is what I gather, and they talk of where they shall pass the days of their honeymoon. They plan to go to Egypt. He paused. Lynette said sharply, Well? Poirot went on. Is that is a month or two ago. By the girl's face? I do not forget it. I know that I shall remember if I see it again. And I remember, too, the man's voice. And I think you can guess, madame, when it is I see the one and hear the other again. It is here in Egypt. The man is on his honeymoon, yes, but he is on his honeymoon with another woman. Lynette said sharply, What of it? I've already mentioned the facts. The facts? 
Yes. Well, then, Poirot said slowly, the girl in the restaurant mentioned a friend, a friend whom she was very positive would not let her down. That friend, I think, was you, madame. Lynette flushed. Yes. I told you we'd been friends. And she trusted you? Yes. She hesitated for a moment, biting her lip impatiently. Then, as Poirot did not seem disposed to speak, she broke out. Of course, the whole thing was very unfortunate, but look, these things happen, Monsieur Poirot. Ah, yes, they happen, madame, he paused. You are of the Church of England, I presume? Uh, yes, Lynette looked slightly bewildered. Then you have heard portions of the Bible read aloud in church? You have heard of King David and of the rich man who had many flocks and herds, and the poor man who had one ewe lamb, and of how the rich man took the poor man's one ewe lamb? That was something that happened, madame. Lynette sat up. Her eyes flashed angrily. I see perfectly what you're driving at, Monsieur Poirot. You think, to put it vulgarly, that I stole my friend's young man. Well, looking at the matter sentimentally, which is, I suppose, the way people of your generation cannot help looking at things, that is possibly true. But the real hard truth is different. I don't deny that Jackie was passionately in love with Simon, but I don't think you take into account that he may not have been equally devoted to her. He was very fond of her, but I think that even before he met me, he was beginning to feel that he had made a mistake. Look at it clearly, Monsieur Poirot. Simon discovers that it is I he loves, not Jackie. What's he to do? Be heroically noble and marry a woman he doesn't care for, and therefore probably ruin three lives? For it is doubtful whether he could make Jackie happy under these circumstances. If he were actually married to her, when he met me, I agree that it might be his duty to stick to her, though I'm not really sure of that. If one person is unhappy, the other suffers too. But an engagement is not really binding. If a mistake has been made, then surely it's better to face the fact before it's too late. I admit that it was very hard on Jackie, and I'm terribly sorry about it, but there it is. It was inevitable. I wonder. She stared at him. What do you mean? Well, it is very sensible, very logical, all that you say, but he does not explain one thing. Well, what is that? Your own attitude, madame. See you, this pursuit of you, you might take it in two ways. It might cause you annoyance, yes, or it might stir your pity that your friend should have been so deeply hurt as to throw all regard for the conventions aside. But that is not the way you react. No. To you this persecution is intolerable. And why? It can be for one reason only, that you feel a sense of guilt. Lynette sprang to her feet. How dare you? Really, Monsieur Poirot, this is going too far. But I do dare, madame. I am going to speak to you quite frankly. I suggest to you that although you may have endeavoured to gloss over the fact yourself, you deliberately set about taking your husband from your friend. I suggest that you felt strongly attracted to him at once. But I suggest that there was a moment when you hesitated, when you realised that there was a choice, that you could refrain or go on. I suggest that the initiative rested with you, not with Monsieur Doyle. You are beautiful, madame. You are rich. You are clever, intelligent, and you have charm. You could have exercised that charm, or you could have restrained it. You had everything, madame, that life can offer. Your friend's life was bound up in one person. You knew that. But though you hesitated, you did not hold your hand. You stretched it out. And like the rich man in the Bible, you took the poor man's one ewe lamb. There was a silence. Lynette controlled herself with an effort and said in a cold voice, All this is quite beside the point. No, it is not beside the point. I am explaining to you just why the unexpected appearances of Mademoiselle de Belfort have upset you so much. It is because 
that though she may be unwomanly and undignified in what she is doing, you have the inner conviction that she has right on her side. That's not true. Poirot shrugged his shoulders. Well, you refuse to be honest with yourself. Not at all. Poirot said gently, I should say, madame, that you have had a happy life, that you have been generous and kindly in your attitude towards others. I've tried to be, said Lynette. The impatient anger died out of her face. She spoke simply, almost forlornly. And that is why the feeling that you have deliberately caused injury to someone upsets you so much, and why you are so reluctant to admit the fact. Pardon me if I have been impertinent by the psychology, it is the most important factor in a case. Lynette said slowly, And even supposing what you say were true, and I don't admit it, mind, what can be done about it now? One can't alter the past. One must deal with things as they are. Poirot nodded. You have the clear brain. <laughs> yes, one cannot go back over the past. One must accept things as they are. And sometimes, madame, that is all one can do. Accept the consequences of one's past deeds. You mean, said Lynette incredulously, that I can do nothing? Nothing? You must have courage, madame. That is what it seems like to me. Lynette said slowly, Couldn't you... Talk to Jackie, to Miss de Belfort, reason with her? Yes, I could do that. I will do that if you would like me to do so. But do not expect much result. I fancy that Mademoiselle de Belfort is so much in the grip of a fixed idea that nothing will turn her from it. But surely we can do something to extricate ourselves. Hmm? You could, of course, return to England and establish yourself in your own house. Oh, but even then, I suppose Jacqueline is capable of planting herself in the village, so that I should see her every time I went out of the grounds. True. Besides, said Lynette slowly, I don't think that Simon would agree to run away. What is his attitude in this? Oh, he's furious, simply furious. Poirot nodded thoughtfully. Lynette said appealingly, You will talk to her? Yes, I will do that. But it is my opinion that I shall not be able to accomplish anything. Lynette said violently, Jackie is extraordinary. One can't tell what she will do. You spoke just now of certain threats she had made. Would you tell me what those threats were? Lynette shrugged her shoulders. She threatened to, well, kill us both. Jackie can be rather Latin sometimes. I see. Poirot's tone was grave. You will act for me? No, madame. His tone was firm. I will not accept a commission from you. I will do what I can in the interests of humanity. That, yes. There is here a situation that is full of difficulty and danger. I will do what I can to clear it up, but I am not so very sanguine as to my chance of success. Lynette Doyle said slowly, but you will not act for me? No, madame, said Hercule Poirot. Chapter 5 Hercule Poirot found Jacqueline de Belfort sitting on the rocks directly overlooking the Nile. He'd felt fairly certain that she had not retired for the night and that he would find her somewhere about the grounds of the hotel. She was sitting with her chin cupped in the palms of her hands, and she didn't turn her head or look round at the sound of his approach. Mademoiselle de Belfort, said Poirot, you permit that I speak to you for a little moment? Jacqueline turned her head slightly. A faint smile played round her lips. Certainly, she said. You are Monsieur Hercule Poirot, I think. Shall I make a guess? You are acting for Mrs. Doyle, who has promised you a large fee if you succeed in your mission. Poirot sat down on a bench near her. Your assumption is partially correct, he said, smiling. I have just come from Mrs. Doyle, but I am not accepting any fee from her, and strictly speaking, I am not acting for her. Oh. Jacqueline studied him attentively. Then why have you come? 
she asked abruptly. Hercule Poirot's reply was in the form of another question. Have you ever seen me before, mademoiselle? She shook her head. Uh, no, I don't think so. Yet I have seen you. I sat next to you once at Chematante. You were there with Mr. Simon Doyle. A strange mask-like expression came over the girl's face. She said, I remember that evening. Since then, said Poirot, many things have occurred. Yes, as you say, many things have occurred. Her voice was hard with an undertone of desperate bitterness. Mademoiselle, I speak as a friend. Barry, you're dead. She looked startled. What do you mean? Give up the past. Turn to the future. What is done is done. Bitterness will not undo it. Well, I'm sure that that would suit dear Lynette admirably. Poirot made a gesture. I am not thinking of her at this moment. I am thinking of you. You have suffered, yes, but what you are doing now will only prolong that suffering. She shook her head. You're wrong. There are times when I almost enjoy myself. Oui, and that, mademoiselle, is the worst of all. She looked up swiftly. You're not stupid, she said. She added slowly, I believe you mean to be kind. Go home, mademoiselle. You are young. You have brains. The world is before you. Jacqueline shook her head slowly. You don't understand? Oh, oh, you won't. Simon is my world. Love is not everything, mademoiselle, Poirot said gently. It is only when we are young that we think it is. But the girl still shook her head. You don't understand? She shot him a quick look. You know all about it, of course. You've talked to Lynette. And you were in the restaurant that night. Simon and I loved each other. I know that you loved him. She was quick to perceive the inflection of his words. She repeated with emphasis, We loved each other. And I loved Lynette. I trusted her. She was my best friend. All her life Lynette has been able to buy everything she wanted. She's never denied herself anything. When she saw Simon, she wanted him. And she just took him. And he allowed himself to be bought? Jacqueline shook her dark head slowly. No, it's not quite like that. If it were, I shouldn't be here now. You're suggesting that Simon isn't worth caring for. If he'd married Lynette for her money, that would be true. But he didn't marry her for her money. It's more complicated than that. There's such a thing as glamour, Monsieur Poirot. And money helps that. Lynette had an atmosphere, you see. She was the queen of a kingdom, the young princess, luxurious to her fingertips. It was like a stage setting. She had the world at her feet. One of the richest and most sought-after peers in England, wanting to marry her. And she stoops instead to the obscure Simon Doyle. Do you wonder it went to his head? She made a sudden gesture. Look at the moon up there. You see her very plainly, don't you? She's very real. But if the sun were to shine, you wouldn't be able to see her at all. It was rather like that. I was the moon. When the sun came out, Simon couldn't see me any more. He was dazzled. He couldn't see anything but the sun. Lynette. She paused and then went on. So you see, it was glamour. She went to his head. And then there's her complete assurance, her habit of command. She's so sure of herself that she makes other people sure. Simon was weak, perhaps, but then he's only a very simple person. He would have loved me and me only if Lynette hadn't come along and snatched him up in her golden chariot. And I know, I know perfectly that he wouldn't have ever fallen in love with her if she hadn't made him. That is what you think. I know it. He loved me. He will always love me, Poirot said. Even now? A quick answer seemed to rise to her lips, then be stifled. She looked at Poirot, and a deep 
burning colour spread over her face. She looked away, her head dropped down. She said in a low, stifled voice, Yes, I know. He hates me now. Yes, hates me. He'd better be careful. With a quick gesture, she fumbled in a little silk bag that lay on the seat. Then she held out her hand. On the palm of it was a small, pearl-handled pistol. A dainty toy it looked. Nice little thing, isn't it? she said. Looks too foolish to be real, but it is real. One of those bullets would kill a man or a woman, and I'm a good shot. She smiled a far away, reminiscent smile. When I went home as a child with my mother to South Carolina, my grandfather taught me to shoot. He was the old-fashioned kind that believes in shooting, especially where honour is concerned. My father, too, he fought several duels as a young man. He was a good swordsman. He killed a man once. That was over a woman. So you see, Monsieur Poirot, she met his eyes squarely, I have hot blood in me. I bought this when it first happened. I meant to kill one or other of them. The trouble was I couldn't decide which. Both of them would have been unsatisfactory. If I'd thought Lynette would have looked afraid. <laughs> but she's got plenty of physical courage. She can stand up to physical action. And then I thought I'd wait. That appealed to me more and more. After all, I could do it any time. It would be more fun to wait and think about it. And when this idea came to my mind, to follow them, whenever they arrived at some faraway spot and were together and happy, they should see me. And it worked. It got Lynette badly. In a way, nothing else could have done. It got right under her skin. That was when I began to enjoy myself. And there's nothing she can do about it. I'm always perfectly pleasant and polite. There's not a word they can take hold of. It's poisoning everything, everything for them. Her voice rang out, clear and silvery. Poirot grasped her arm. Be quiet. Quiet, I tell you. Jacqueline looked at him. Well, she said. Her smile was definitely challenging. Mademoiselle, I beseech you, do not do what you are doing. <laughs> Leave dear Lynette alone, you mean? No, it is deeper than that. Do not open your heart to evil. Her lips fell apart. A look of bewilderment came into her eyes. Poirot went on gravely. Because if you do, evil will come. Oh, yes, very surely evil will come. It will enter in and make its home within you, and after a little while it will no longer be possible to drive it out. Jacqueline stared at him. Her glance seemed to waver, to flicker uncertainly. She said, I don't know. Then she cried out defiantly, You can't stop me. No, said Hercule Poirot, I cannot stop you. His voice was sad. Even if I were to kill her, you couldn't stop me? No, not if you are willing to pay the price. Jacqueline de Belfort laughed. <laughs> I'm not afraid of death. What have I got to live for, after all? I suppose you believe it's very wrong to kill a person who has injured you, even if they've taken away everything you had in the world. Poirot said steadily, Yes, mademoiselle. I believe it is the unforgivable offence to kill. Jacqueline laughed again. Then you ought to approve of my present scheme of revenge, because, you see, as long as it works, I shan't use that pistol. Oh, but I'm afraid. Yes, afraid sometimes. It all goes red. I want to hurt her, to stick a knife into her, to put my dear little pistol close against her head, and then just press with my finger. Oh! The exclamation startled him. What is it, mademoiselle? She had turned her head and was staring into the shadows. Someone standing over there. He's gone now. Poirot looked round sharply. The place seemed quite deserted. There seems no one here but ourselves, mademoiselle. He got up. In any case, I have said all I came to say. I wish you good night. Jacqueline got up too. She said almost pleadingly, You do understand that I can't do what you asked me to do. 
Poirot shook his head. No, for you could do it. There is always a moment. Your friend Lynette, there was a moment too in which she could have held her hand. She let it pass by. And if one does that, then one is committed to the enterprise and there comes no second chance. No second chance, said Jacqueline de Belfort. She stood brooding for a moment, then she lifted her head defiantly. Good night, Monsieur Poirot. He shook his head sadly and followed her up the path to the hotel. End of Disc 2